The number I want to show you is that in terms of residences, that's how much we could be producing. So what we have is that we have nearly 7 million people in Rio wasting all that kind of potential. And uh, what does it mean? Well, um, last year I led the process of developing a resiliency strategy for the city of Rio. And uh, I went to each department to ask, what could happen that could make you lose your sleep? What what kind of crisis could happen that could exceed the city's capacity for response? What are the main vulnerabilities of the city of Rio? And we asked not just city officials, but academia, NGOs, and uh, everybody came up. Uh, some things were very surprising to me. Um, regarding uh, crisis for energy, they can range from uh, inconvenience to catastrophic. It's actually very easy to paralyze a city. Ask me how outside, not now. But uh, it is, uh, whether intentionally or not, it's not very difficult to bring things to a halt in a city. And um, it's actually more, uh, uh, more difficult to regain uh, my sleep afterwards after hearing all those kinds of possibilities. But, and then, that's when we realize how the city of Rio and so many other are fragile to this kind of po possibility of crisis in energy. So basically, we don't generate any energy in the city. We need to bring from outside, from a distribution line, perhaps. And uh, there are no options, basically, in inside the city. And having not not having options is not resilient at all. Actually, it's fragile. It's very fragile. And uh, so I thought, I started to think, what would be a city resilient in terms of energy? And I wanted to come up with an image for that, and I could not. And I kept thinking about it, and what came to my uh, mind was something completely different. But I think it illustrates my point very well. So I think that in the future, a city that is resilient in terms of energy will actually look like some of Mark Rothko's paintings. <laughs> and uh, I will be passing along many um, um, of his paintings. Any of them can make my point, okay? So do not get fixated on any image in particular. Um, the first point, the first comparison, would be with immersion. Mark Rothko thought that we should be very close to his paintings so as to feel it and be part of it. That's why he called it color vision, uh, color field paintings. We actually have that nowadays, but with consumption. We are so immersed in consumption of energy, we don't feel it. Regarding uh, generation, we have no idea whatsoever how it arrives in our homes or uh, how much you exp expand and how much you could possi possibly generate. Uh, one thing that is common to all Mark Rothko's paintings is that there are many layers of colors. No one knows exactly how he painted his methods. It's a secret to this day, but he kept adding layers and layers of colors. So if you pay attention, this one, there is some blue and some yellow and some pink and some black and more orange and blue. And uh, they are transparent enough that you can see below. Some colors even appear to be receding, especially this black one. Some, some are popping out. And in terms of technologies of energy, how, that's how I see them as well. That technologies, they will be blurred. We are going to live with them. There will be lots of them concurrently. It does not have to be a competition. They can actually be working together to do something aesthetically pleasing. Um, regarding uh, the colors as well, 
you can see that there are no hard edges. And that's how I foresee the future of energy. Um, the, the, we will be so immersed in it and there will be so much variation. We may not notice when one starts and one ends or when energy cons uh, uh, generation and consumption ends. Um, also, regarding, uh, you see those blocks of colors? They seem to be floating. I think this pertains to the idea that um, in the future, um, it generation will not be fixed. It can vary with the rhythm of the city. It can vary with whether it's morning, whether it's night. If people are uh, walking, if they are cycling, as they move around the city in public transportation, as they arrive home, as they leave home. So uh, we can generate energy as we live our lives in the city. So it's not fixed. Actually, uh, when you see a Rothko painting, if you turn it sideways, it even looks like a graph. Yes, uh, uh, any one of them will look like a graph. Um, so uh, this one is interesting also. We have the colors and etc. And I believe we were just scratching the surface of we could have in terms of energy generation and resilience in cities. Also, one thing that in terms of what you see here is collaboration as well. Uh, the colors, they go along with each other very well. And uh, it's not only about self-sufficiency, the way they intermingle, but also about collaboration. And uh, I believe that's one um, uh, um, next step. And, uh, and I thought, what could be the most luxurious thing you could have if you can um, generate your own energy and what would our 100% renewable energy city look like? What are the possibilities of that? And what could be the ultimate luxury to someone living in a city? Uh, I thought, what if we could all turn off our lights? If we could, our neighborhood, we could one day, everybody say, let's all turn off our lights. And from our porches, from our windows, we can see the starry sky. Just imagine this kind of collective effort and the ultimate luxury for a city. And how that would be the coronation of something extremely resilient, which is climate, climate friendly, which is all that renewable cities could give us. Thank you.